The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Before we get started, I would like to do a quick sound check and a visual check. If you can hear me and view the PowerPoint slide on the screen, please raise your hands. Perfect, thank you very much. Okay, we'll get started. Hello everyone, my name is Therese Kosongo, Program Manager with the Canadian Institute of Plumbing and Heating. Welcome to the CIPH and CWQA webinar titled, Worried About Water Quality After Building Shutdown? I'm delighted to note that we have 141 sites registered across Canada for today's session, which is really great news. Before I introduce our webinar presenters, please note that we will address all questions at the end of today's session. However, you can type your questions directly into the question box throughout the webinar. The question box is located in the webinar control window on the right-hand side of your screen. Also note that a recording of today's presentation will be made available to all attendees following the webinar, and you will have the opportunity to submit questions after the session has ended. Today's webinar presenters are Jason Jackson and Shelley Peters. Jason Jackson has been at Fleming College in various roles, including Professor Mechanical Trades, Academic Chair, and Acting Dean for the Schools of Trade and Technology and the School of Business. With a 20 plus year career in the water, wastewater, and energy sectors, he offers an extensive and broad range skill set in both trades and technology automation. As past president of the Canadian Water Quality Association and incoming chair for the Canadian Hydronics Council, he brings an extensive industry network related to water, both provincially and federally. Our second presenter, Shelley Peters, is a member of the water quality industry in Canada for over 30 years. Most recently, she holds the position of Executive Director for the Canadian Water Quality Association. Shelley is a past president of the CWQA and served on the Board of Directors for over eight years. She has also been involved with other boards and committees outside of the water treatment industry. Please join me in welcoming Jason Jackson and Shelley Peters. Well, good afternoon, everyone, Over. and uh, thank you for attending our uh, session here on uh, water quality and building shutdowns. Uh, again, I'm Jason Jackson, and uh, Shelley, can you say hi? Hello, everyone. Welcome. And uh, so Shelley and I will be uh, working through this presentation webinar uh, together and uh, we'll be spawning off on different points to talk about uh, parts of water quality and or buildings as we go through the, the presentation. So, uh, so we'll start moving through the presentation and uh, as we do we'll talk about different components. So today's uh, presentation is meant to be sort of an introduction to what we can expect or may want to consider when we come back into buildings that have been uh, shut down for various reasons and under our current conditions with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and buildings and surveys and components being shut down, what are points we have to consider uh, getting those back into a, a place where they provide good water quality for our consumer? And some of the points to consider might be on the mechanical side, systems, mechanical systems, building plumbing and piping, water treatment systems, who are the population using the building and their vulnerability? And then other emerging water qualities that may have always been there and we've been addressing over a number of years, but now we need to take a little more of a focus and ensure that it's working okay. And again, it doesn't matter whether a building shutdown is temporary or prolonged or seasonal, there are risks that come back to water quality and things we have to consider as we're going through that. Just a quick disclaimer for today is that all the products uh, and labels have been removed or blanked out, so it's a generic presentation. 
Uh, it's a reference and education document, and the idea is to generate questions and some present uh, present some ideas that might help you in your building as we go through it. Uh, photos are all referenced or original, and uh, some of the references come from the World Health Organization and the National Building Code. So just to start off, I'd like to know who's out there and who we're presenting to. So if you look at the very top of your screen, you'll see a respond to poll. And if you've got a mobile device or anything, please enter in the top part. It says pollev.com and Jason Jackson 125. And you'll be able to interact directly with this. And please enter in your profession of whatever uh, it is your profession or your background uh, to see what's here. Now there's a little timer going at the bottom and we'll put in what it is. Okay, and we'll just see who's out there. See, we have one plumber in the group. There, water operator. I'll enter in mine as well. You can see there. There may be some questions. We're going to use this poll uh, system for a couple other components of the uh, presentation as well. So uh, if you can, please put that in. Okay, great. It's interesting to know that uh, across Canada, we have a number of people who take care of water systems and are involved in how water systems are both uh, designed, managed, serviced, and then ultimately how they interact with the public and or with the consumer. So it's interesting to know who else may be out there thinking about what's going forward. So technical managers, sales managers, water operators, and as we go through this presentation, we'll also talk about the interaction between different regulations and what professions and components you need to have under your uh, repertoire and, um, and abilities to see what's there. So, so about 12 seconds left for this and we'll move on. Jason, do you have your camera on? I have a camera. It's not on though right now. Oh, okay. No. All right. Unless it is, you can let me know. Yeah. No, it's not. Okay. Manufacturers online, Vika. Excellent. Okay. So you can see we have a fairly diverse, diverse uh, point, lots of managers on the line who are the people helping make decisions about what's going to happen with their professional technical response. So to start out, I'd like to take a look at this water sample that's uh, provided on the screen. And when you look at it, take a look at the numbers, look at the various components and Decide if there's anything in there that you find alarming, any number that might be a concern. And for me, I, I'd like to focus on those two components first off, because this is a drinking water fountain that may be found in any one of our facilities. And if you look at that, we have a coliform of five and a copper on a grab sample that's 5,300, well over the maximum detectable limits that are required. So if this is water quality that's found, and then if I was then further to tell you that this was a public building on municipal water, would you be concerned by that? Certainly as we run through different components of water samples and understanding what water quality is affecting it, we have to think about conditions that lead to poor water quality, non-potable materials, cross connections, stagnant water, building shutdowns and seasonal startups, which we're gonna talk about a little more today, low or inadequate flow, which comes back to that a poor design, temperature control. How does that affect Legionella potentially and or cross connection? Uh, management and maintenance and repair. And the first word being complacent, meaning maybe it's just something that's being neglected. Is that something that can be moved forward? And of course, and the last one is bad design. So other considerations we have to think about, and certainly this is an influence of who we have today in our buildings and different facilities, is we have to think about who's using the build building, the vulnerability of those people who live, work, and also visit the building. And that would also dictate the frequency and length of the visit that they may be there. So for instance, if they're just transient, coming through and getting a cup of coffee and moving on their way, what is the quality of the water and how does that affect them individually? But if that's a facility where you work every day and you drink from the same tap and have the same water quality, is there an impact to your health prolonged? or is there an impact to other people in the building prolonged? And of course, then also think about the types of water use, the amount and the exposure. How often do you have that? Vulnerability can also be the population who's living and working there. And if you look at the pictures that are involved, 
our nursing homes, our daycares, and those places where we go to get well are definitely something we have to consider providing great water quality. So in this pandemic shutdown, Hi, everyone. I just want to do a quick sound check. Are you able to hear me? If you are, please click the raise hand icon. Okay, perfect. I see some people are still able to hear me. I think we've lost our presenter for the moment. Um, so if you give us just a couple minutes, I'm going to see if I can contact him to see if we can get him back. Hello, everyone. So it seems like we've uh, we're having some technical difficulties and we've lost our presenter. So I'm just going to ask that we stay on the line for a couple minutes while we try to get him reconnected to the webinar. Um, I do see that you are all able to still hear me. So we are going to try to do our best to see if we can get him back onto the webinar. So just hold tight, everyone. in their apartment. So what are they doing in that apartment? Are they creating new ideas and new concepts for business? Are they creating something that might be of legal or illegal obligations? And Jason, I'm just going to interrupt you for a moment. Yes. I think that you froze for a couple minutes. So oh. uh, on our end here, right, yeah. so I'm going to ask you just to go back a couple slides. I'm sorry about that. No, it's no problem. So which one? So we left off at. I'm sorry about that, everyone. Uh, educational facilities. Are we at that point? Go back a couple more. Really? So that's a couple of minutes of sitting. Yes. Yes, this was the last slide that we left on. My goodness. OK, well, I apologize, everyone. This is one of the benefits or disadvantages of working from home and uh, a good Internet connection is everything. So I'll just skip to the next one here because this refers to everything we're talking about. So hopefully we're still connected and we talk about public buildings. So in each one of our facilities that we work through and uh, are bringing back online, we have to consider what's happening in those buildings currently and what we want to happen in future. So places like museums and art galleries or theaters where we may want to get a beverage from, do we want to be the first place or first person getting water from a, a dispenser when it hasn't been in use in a long time? Then also, do we think about drinking water outlets? Are they kept and maintained for full hygiene? We'll talk more about those as we go through each one of them. Education facilities. I mentioned I'm from the education industry. 
and uh, our facility has been shut off again for about 43 days. But within our facility, we have water uses for teaching, research, and laboratories. And we have to consider each area of that education facility and whether or not it's actually working correctly, being maintained correctly, and is it being flushed. I wash stations that are sitting quiet. And then what about water bottle or bottled water coolers and water coolers that have been sitting stagnant or dormant for a period of time? Is there a potential for bacteria growth and or other contaminants that could be there? So we have to review all of those systems to ensure. Hotels and conference centers. So we've been away from our hotels and conference centers and we have to think about bringing those back online. But also, even when the parts of the buildings that may be used for seasonal or construction or they're going through a renovation, are those building sections being brought back online for service and being flushed and disinfected correctly? The building code says there are requirements for ensuring that we have good safe water at the tap and I think sometimes we consider municipal water supplies as just taking care of it for us because they have chlorine residual. Something to think about. One of the factors we have to put into place as well is that we have to also ensure the health of the people coming into our facility but we want to make sure they leave as healthy as they were when they when they arrived. Apartment complexes. Apartments can be a strange place. With isolation people are in at home and they are in their apartment. And it's not so much the fact that the building's not in use, it's what's going on within that building while people are at home more than ever. So modifications that might've been done to the apartment piping or plumbing, and maybe the, uh, the actual owner didn't realize what was going on. And the other component is potential illegal operations happening in the apartment units. You never know what's going on in the, the unit next door or above you in different floors. And we have to consider the fact that with those new pieces, who's inspecting to ensure things are working correctly. Transportation terminals. I've spent a lot of time in airports traveling across Canada and the US, as many other people who are in the technical managers and sales managers, uh, as mentioned in our little poll. We have to think about what it is and where we're transferring and how we're gonna ensure that those places are in good repair. Cross connections are, eminent within different buildings and we have to think about washrooms, restaurants and kiosks as they come back online. How do we ensure that when we have people using those spaces that they're going to be kept safe and in good repair as we move forward? Factories in industry. Liquid chemicals that circulate within water for heating and cooling. Are those being maintained correctly? And then we talk about cross connection and control and I'll speak a bit about that in a few moments. Cross connection and uh, control, ensuring that we have area and premise isolation, ensuring that we have no chemicals that can backfeed or backflow to a system. And again, a number of these facilities, we have eyewash stations and safety showers that need to be inspected and ensure that they're working correctly, both in piping, plumbing, and water quality. Needless to say, our hospitals and medical centers are the focus and focal point for all of us right now. Ensuring that those spaces are kept clean and in good repair for those frontline workers who are ensuring that we're going to come out of this pandemic in good, uh, good repair and are safe for ourselves is important for all of us. But we also have to consider the fact that the areas that they're using need to be maintained both for water quality and ensure that the areas are going to be safe for people who are using it. It's taken for granted that the water quality being in, used in these facilities is just ready to go for whenever we need it. We need to consider heating and cooling and ventilation systems, which will be an upcoming webinar later on. So back to our poll for a moment, who would be best for maintaining water? Who's responsible for maintaining water quality in a building? So take a minute and go to your uh, poll and take a look, quick look and add in who it is. Who do you think is responsible for maintaining building water quality? And as this builds, the, the ones that are the biggest will have the, the largest piece. So owner is going to come out as a higher one because it's the greatest word wall. So keep adding in for another couple of minutes and we'll see what happens here.
And essentially, we know that we have managers and property owners, but what about the plumber? What about water operators? What about the utilities, the utility providers? Are they concerned by those sorts of items? Is there a liability that falls upon health inspectors or building inspectors as part of this moves forward? If I was the owner of a building, is there a liability or a component that I have to consider in this new reality of how we're moving forward? I definitely think there could be. Okay, so it looks like owner is our one who's going to be responsible for that. Well, let's take a look at it the next slide and decide whether we all agree. So if I'm in a building, who are the people who interact in ensuring that the building is in good repair and good health and is ready and safe for people coming, coming to the building and leaving the building? Well, engineers, they help design and ensure structurally and uh, components are in good shape. Plumbers, plumbers come in and ensure water systems, both water coming in and water leaving. And we're going to talk a bit about water systems being drinking water system and what that means and the water system found within a building or a facility. Backflow and cross connection specialists. I have an ongoing uh, bet with anyone at any time that I can go into a building and in the first 10 minutes find a cross connection and you'll buy me dinner. And I've never lost that challenge at any time across North America. Those are everywhere. Water treatment professionals. So members of CWQA and or WQA and how they can interact with the building to ensure the water quality is of good shape. Water operators was mentioned. But one of the ones that comes out the most is the custodian. And I think that's an underlying component. Custodians are in the building every day. They are maintaining the health of different surfaces. They know their building better than anyone. And a lot of times, if you have a custodian, if you have a question about that building, you find a custodian, they'll know the answer. So as we consider different parts of the people and the different areas of the building that could be in question, what about a risk assessment? How do we go through a building and ensure or evaluate different risks that could be in place for us to consider? Does public health have aspects of water quality that they have to monitor? Absolutely. We have regulations which dictate what happens within our water systems before it comes to the building and of course while it's inside a building. Is there local legislative requirements, standards, codes and practices we have to consider as we move through building and designing and maintaining facilities? Water systems and buildings. We're going to talk about the definitions of those here in a few moments. What about identifying different hazards or potential sources of hazards in the building? I'll give you an example, cross connection of potentially of a boiler to a potable water system. If there wasn't the correct cross connection protection in place, simply the dynamics of water and physics and thermal expansion could cause a contaminant to come back into the water. Evaluate at risk, identify and assess how you're going to control that. So if we have a kiosk that hasn't been used in a long period of time and it's been sitting, it could be in a potential risk. Well, how are we going to assess it and then bring it back into its reality of working correctly with good safe water. Might need some more steps than we're used to. Operational monitoring, make sure that they're in place and running. And of course, how do we verify everything that's been done? I believe recording how people go about working in a building and what they've done each day becomes a piece of accountability that might be a requirement in the new future as we go forward. I also think that moving forward, everyone should be very concerned and looking at things in the National Building Code and things that may have been overlooked at times, but things that need to be moving forward. Part six, heating, ventilating, and air conditioning. Part seven is a plumbing service and defining which components of a water system and or a wastewater system are in place. And then there's some other CSA standards, I think, that can come into place. And maybe Shelley, for a moment, you could speak about uh, B483 and what it means to our industry. Sure. Um, so the CSA B483 is, is specific to the drinking water treatment systems. So your reverse osmosis or anything else that might be considered um, a point of use type system. And there's been extensive uh, um, studies and work done through CSA and, and a group from the CWQA um, in making sure that uh, the requirements are there to ensure that they're going to have good quality water through each one of those drinking water treatment systems. So that work continues with our uh, CSA group and um, um, 
a familiar uh, voice is is uh, very involved with that still with uh, Kevin Wong and uh, Scott McDonald uh, being two uh, key players on that uh, committee for us. So that's great. Well, thanks, Shelley. Uh, and again, I also come back to uh, CSA B64, which is the backflow and cross connection module. There's a number of other codes and regulations we have to consider, uh, including drinking water standards and components as well. So we'll can consider those here in a few moments as we run through. So provincial regulations, and I went into the actual uh, number of different codes, whether it was here in Ontario or BC or, or from uh, Nova Scotia, and I was looking at different codes and regulations. And here in Ontario, we have some def definitions that we use for water and who's responsible. So I've been watching some of the questions come through and I see some of them are as we are a school board and therefore our facilities, may, our staff maintain our facilities. And that's great when you have that type of control. But what if it's a system that doesn't have that type of ownership? So when we look at the different parts of a water system, a water distribution system, and this is a, an excerpt from it, talks about all those pipes and fittings and valves that convey potable water to fixtures and plumbing appliances. That's inside the building. The water purveyor is the owner or the operator of the drinking water system. The drinking water system is actually the water mains, the line coming in, which is the service pipe, and that could be a bit of an argument whether it's going to be the drinking water owner or the private supplier owner. So those components come into place. And then the water system is inside the building. So I think at times we miscue where these different definitions are, and we have drinking water system and water system that sometimes are used interactively between each other, but it's who owns those different systems. And that becomes liability. In British Columbia, we talk about pro provincial regulations. And if you read here, it says here, the following are excluded in the definition of domestic water system, which talks about the water system in the building. And in that case, we think about different components that are being interacted within the system. So certainly you as an owner or an operator or somebody in maintenance may be taking care of the actual plumbing and facility, but bottled water production and distribution and for drinking water dispensing machines, so drinking water fountains or those types of dispensing machines that are for bottle fills may be excluded from somebody who has to maintain them, yet there could be a potential risk. And then also the building system. We have to ensure that we're looking at the building system. I bring these regulations up because across Canada, each province has its own piece in which they add in different parts of regulation. Here in Ontario, it's Reg 170, Regulation 170, and it dictates everything that we have to do for the drinking water system. But then it falls back into the plumbing code for more things that related to the actual water system inside the building. And I think we need to ensure we're following good practices both sides. So some jurisdictions have cross-connection control programs. And as part of a well-designed system, we wanna make sure that no hazards, things that are in the water or connected to the water system can cause a backflow or back pressure scenario that may impede health. You know, a number of years ago, we did a cross-connection survey, which means going through a building, checking out every water connection possible within that facility and looking at the risks and trying to identify which ones may be a potential hazard. And we found one that was uh, part of a boiler system and a heating system. And right next to the boiler room was the janitor's office area. So we went in, did our survey, found a situation where we said, this is a problem. And we installed a backflow device on the boiler makeup water, ensured that it was compliant and everything was good. I spoke to the uh, janitor or the custodian that, that afternoon and said, you know, if there's any concerns or problems, please give us a call, let us know from there give you a small profile of the custodian. Great elderly gentleman, a little crusty, but boy, he really understood it was his building. The very next morning, I got a phone call from him. What did you do to my water? My coffee tastes different. And I thought, well, that's an interesting comment to come from somebody who knows their building very well. I'll go through what he does every day. He comes in in the morning, puts on a pot of coffee, goes for a walk through the facility to check his facility, comes back, has a cup of coffee, and then continues on with this day. What was different was that we had installed a backflow preventer that prevented glycol or glycol type water from thermal expansion coming back into the potable water system. And because he was supplying the, or taking the first water of the day, he was actually getting some cross contamination from that heating system. 
his water and, co and coffee did taste different because of what wasn't there. So don't take any of those for granted as we move through different systems. So little picture on the screen for reference. This is one of the uh, ongoing systems that we see in, in for chemical dispensing. But I wanna bring your attention to a couple of places. See the connection right there? That connection is a cross connection between the potable water directly to that cleaner or disinfectant. And then right beside it, just a little further over from the arrow is the ice maker. And they weren't sure why they were getting pink ice cubes. Facility shuts down for a period of time. We have systems that may fail or may come online. And we could have situations like this where we have contaminated components of water, ice machines, drinking water fountains. We need to have a good look at all those facilities to ensure that we're working properly. What about water treatment devices? And Shelley, would you like to speak to this one for a moment? Sure. Jason is, is famous for finding um, water treatment installations where uh, he, he challenges each one of us in determining what's wrong with this picture. But clearly in this one, we have a direct connection to the sanitary line with absolutely no check valves or backflow. So if this was in a uh, facility where the water was shut down, um, but yet there might have still been someone checking the building, there could have been easily your sewer to come right back into those those units. And then as everything in the building comes back up, that gets put online and that goes through the entire uh, entire building. So, you know, from a Canadian Water Quality Association point of view, uh, each one of our members um, are trained and know to look for each one of these um, issues that uh, clearly are not meeting code of any way, shape or form. So. Um, I challenge all of you as you go out and, and look into this to, to see if you can find some of these great pictures that Jason has provided uh, here today. I say this on a regular basis. I'm so pleasantly surprised and, and even a little disappointed in what I find every day from professionals uh, in the industry. And sometimes it's not our professionals and members or people that we see dear into our industry, but it's those ones who don't, simply don't know or don't care. This facility as well, if you notice on the wall, there's a box called Franklin Electric. It's actually a municipal facility, non-residential, but it's actually on a well. So now we have another whole level of mechanical to consider. So it's not just municipal water that's supplied by a drinking water system. It's also potential systems that have well water and then the other mechanical pieces that come together. So be sure you understand your facility. So what about plumbing materials? This is not new. We've had to work on plumbing materials that have low lead content for many years. And by having that, we have to consider lead content. We have to consider the performance of those materials and then ultimately consumer safety. Going back into the mid 60s, if we had a uh, facility, one of the first things the janitor custodian would do, would they go in and they'd run the water in that facility for a few moments. And ultimately they're trying to flush the lead potential concept or content from the system to bring new fresh water into that building. Might be a good best practice for us to consider moving forward as we see our buildings opening up. Water treatment options. Lots of facilities have water treatment units and much like the photo earlier with the cross connection, we have to consider the fact that they've been sitting stagnant and not doing anything. Is it time to have someone come in, flush the system, backwash, ensure that it's operating correctly, at least to a component that we can ensure we have water quality that's of the best we can have. And how do we do that? We have to have it tested. At some point in time, we'll have to have somebody do either a field test and or do laboratory testing to ensure it's in good working order. We have point of entry systems that might be in place. And this is another gray area within the building code that we have to consider because where does the building control valve begin and end? And we have to decide who's responsible for those facilities and those systems. But then also point of use facilities and systems as well, where we may have a drinking water system under a kitchenette or is somewhere in a, in a filling a bottled water station. We have to ensure that those facilities are working correctly and that water quality is gonna be the optimum coming from there. Point of use. So it's nice to see a, a youngster running up to get a drink of water because here in Canada and the US, we sort of take water for granted. Is this gonna be a new reality? Are we going to allow someone to just jump up to a water fountain, get some water and move on? Or are they going to be a, 
uh, access denied or completely eliminated? It's an interesting concept to think about, but it might actually be. How do we provide a way for people to get water or drinking when they're out and about in our public setting? Certainly something that we're going to have to have a consideration for. Is there a risk? What about point of view surgeries? How often we go to a hotel or one of our conference centers and first thing in the morning we have a buffet or an area. Would there be a requirement to flush and sanitize all of these systems, not only because they've been shut off for a period of time, but what about at a time where we need to bring them online again or on a daily or couple times a day situation? Are we gonna allow consumers to go up and be able to fill their own cup from these? Something to consider. Will these still exist as we move forward? So if you're in the hospitality industry, how do we ensure that this type of setup can still be provided for our consumers as they want? Emerging contaminants. Well, we can say COVID-19 is an emerging contaminant, maybe not in the water level, but certainly how we interact within different buildings. And certainly if we think about the ones that have been on our list of uh, emerging contaminants, things like Legionella, maybe pharmaceuticals, viruses, we have to consider how do we disinfect or how do we ensure that we don't have impact from them on our actual population using our building. And we have to consider, is disinfection always the answer? We always run to using chlorine or peroxide to disinfect the surface, get your Lysol spray, spray it down, that's the best choice. But what about the surfaces like the water inside the piping systems to ensure that we have good quality water? Disinfection may not always be the right choice. Flushing, testing, monitoring might be the next answer for where we have to move forward. So let's go back to our water sample again. And here it is where we knew that we had those concerns with the coliform and with the copper level that's been in place. So where do you think that this type of system was? We talked about being a public building, but it's actually a facility that has a hot water recirculation loop. And this water actually had a cross connection that was uh, hooked up somehow within the system to the drinking water fountains. So this is a mechanical system that's been running the entire time that we've not been in our building, still heating or cooling, but now it's causing a bigger concern with corrosion and a cross connection. We have to pay close attention to our mechanical systems to ensure that they're operating correctly with our drinking water systems and our water system with inside the building. So how do we do that? And Shelley, do you wanna to speak to water testing for a moment? Sure, so we, um, you know, there's several different uh, uh, accredited labs that you can uh, take your water to be tested, but at this point in time too, you're also able to take it to your public health and they will uh, do that testing for you um, uh, for free. But some of the, the emerging uh, areas that you really need to be aware of after a building has sat stagnant is obviously lead, heavy metals, arsenic, um, because all of that, while that water has just been sitting in there, um, has been gathering uh, that right into the water. And once you start to use that water again and, and begin that flushing process through some of the, the equipment, you could be taking uh, additional um, aesthetic like iron uh, hardness and everything like that right off of the pipes. So you not only could you have um, contaminants that you shouldn't be drinking, but you're going to end up with perhaps more um, uh, particles that are going to get into your system, could get into your, the aerators and into the point of entry or point of use equipment that you have through the building. So it's, it's very key um, to once a building kind of comes back online, have several different testing points um, taken. So, you know, check at your coolers, uh, check at the kitchen sinks in, in some of the uh, lunch rooms and things like that. Check your um, uh, fridges if they have uh, any fridge filters in them. That's another point where if that water has sat stagnant and not been used for a period of time, you could have some challenges. So it all comes down to verifying whether water quality is good or not. I go to a tap, get a glass of water, and I can look in it and say, oh my goodness, there's coliform there dump it out and get another glass. That's not reality. So how do we ensure it? We have to do some level of testing. 
And I think that we really need to consider liability at some point in time as we go through this, as we're going to have this new heightened awareness as we go around things. If I test the water and record what I've got tested, then I've got a focus point or a point of reference. And then I can do regular testing on a regular basis to ensure that the water quality in the system is of going to be good quality and it's verified that it's there. It's definitely something to consider as we move forward in, in the new uh, reality of COVID-19. So we're going to go to our question and answer period here in a minute, but in conclusion, I think it's good to understand how an entire water supply system operates. Understanding how the whole system interacts with both mechanical, with drinking water, with humidification, heating and cooling systems, I think it's valid that we have to have a good understanding of all those systems. It's always practical to reference legislations and codes. What are the best practical options for a water system? And if our group has said that they believe the owner is responsible for it, then they need to understand how they can mitigate the risk in evaluating the building. So the question becomes this as we go through further into other training sessions, who's gonna evaluate that risk? Who's gonna go and do a survey or check the system and then do the building water quality? Things to consider. Who's using our water in our facility? And if they're using the water, what's the impact to their internal health? Well, the way around that is to have training and education that ensures that we're actually understanding and now that we know, we can find a way to make things better for places. Now it's tough in small communities to always have the right people around with the right skill sets. So it might be important to make alliances both with associations, licensed professionals, other competent professionals, and in the end, if you're not sure, you need to ask questions. You need to go back to those places and say, I'm not sure about this as a risk or a situation. Maybe I should ask someone to find out. Again, this has been recorded, so you'll find lots of information and, of course, references, National Building Code. The World Health Organization has a great document on water safety in buildings, and you'll see some great reference points and points to consider there, and then some of the local codes and acts as we go through. I have a question section set up here, but I think what we'll do is we'll leave it to Therese and Sarah to work on the questions as they go through their parts. And uh, for the next little bit, let's uh, ask some questions and see whether we can uh, answer them for you as we go through. I've been sort of reading some of the new ones that have come through here, and we see that there's uh, someone from one of the school boards, uh, Anthony, and he says that, uh, you know, we have a school board, therefore it's our own facility staff. And that's a great thing because then you have control and ultimate control over your facility and ensuring the best practical and the best use of the water quality that's there. So I, I would think, Anthony, you're in a very good position for when, uh, as somebody who's taking care of those facilities. Okay, so I'll open it up for questions, and if Sarah and Therese, you could uh, grab some questions and run them through. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, so if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the question box in the right-hand side of your webinar control panel. We don't have any right now, so we'll just wait for a couple minutes to see if any come in. You can also answer, answer or enter questions that's more convenient into the, uh, the poll section that I had set up. Um, one of the questions we had here is, is that some jurisdictions have begun to bring businesses back. What should business owners begin with when they do a startup? Um, without assuming any liability or responsibility for what goes on in a building, I think is a best practice if you look at different parts of both uh, the health unit and or for the building code, it references flushing systems. It references that you, know, you push the system forward and get the water quality moving forward before you begin delivering your product. I think of a coffee dispensing or coffee business that's maybe uh, supplying to the public. The product that you're delivering is the product that us as water treatment professionals, plumbers, people within the industry of water are providing for your product. So we want to make sure ours is as good as it can be. You need to ensure that that's there moving forward. So we do have a couple more questions coming in here, Jason. So should drinking water system filters be changed? As part of any good maintenance practice and moving forward, and Shelly uh, could probably back me up on this one, I think, is that water filter and drinking water systems need to be maintained and managed on a regular basis. 
there'd be best practices for that, ensuring longevity of a filter and or the water quality that's coming through, depending on the loading, depending on what contaminant it's removing and what the, uh, the usage would be. I think it's best to always look at manufacturer, but also again, come back to that water test. Do a water test, ensure that it's running, and then see what you've got for your contaminant. In the end, if you're not sure, a new set of filters are very valuable and very cost effective to ensure water quality moving forward. Another one we have here is how long should a building be flushed for? Well, there are best practices for flushing different parts of buildings. Uh, part seven in the appendix, and if you're in Ontario, part seven of the plumbing code in the appendix, page 134, it talks about areas in which you have to flush the building until you either find, if it's municipal, a chlorine residual of 0.05 milligrams per liter, that's the minimum requirement, and or until you feel that it's moved through. It literally has language like that. So for me, I would flush it until I either had a chlorine residual or for at least five minutes at each tap. That's just the best practice to ensure things are moving forward. Then follow it up with a water test, both bacterial, microbiological, and you may want to potentially do some other field tests to ensure it's there. Mm -hmm. So you would add anything else to that? Another question about Legionella. Legionella, there's plenty of experts in the world on Legionella and different components of mechanical systems. Legionella, again, found in heating and cooling systems. I think it'd be practical to ensure that you're checking both the makeup water going to our heating and cooling systems, one place to ensure that it's there, and make sure that the temperatures for those systems, so if it's a hot water tank, that the tank, and this is coming from the plumbing code, that the water quality in the tank is at 140 degrees Fahrenheit as per the code, but at the tap, depending if it's being mixed down to a specific temperature, no greater than 120. 140 is the minimum requirement for what's required. It's right in the building code. Do you have a startup checklist template that we could share? We have one being created right now. And I think that it's probably a very good thing for inspectors and for people who are uh, building owners or people using their businesses to have a checklist or a best practices checklist, which would then reference back to the people who help take care of their facility. And I think that that would be a great item to have for everyone moving forward. Jason, um, can I just, uh, yeah. just a so, second, I want to go back to that Legionella one. Um, one of the key yeah. areas, and these might be one of the last areas that are open, but uh, in gyms, in their showers, uh, would be one of the very key areas where you would want to make sure that um, you've addressed either the shower heads or flush that hot water tank for those, um, for the showers. Yes, I agree. Ensuring that you've got uh, good temperature as part of it, and that's good building maintenance as well as we go through it. Here's another question. It says, uh, do I call my local CWQA member or a plumber for startup and maintenance or both? Well, that's a, a bit of a loaded question because I think that in essence, uh, everyone's expertise comes down to where, where they're best suited. And both would probably be the best choice depending on what system you may have. But I think reaching out to whoever your professional is, you define your professional, whoever your professional is, and or to an association like CIPH and or CWQA, reach out to them and say, here's what I have. What do you think? And they will provide you with names of people nearby. I think you need to have a good team in place to ensure you've got good water quality. What about hydronic heating systems? Hydronic heating systems, if they're closed loop or open loop systems, probably already have the system running since it's been this time of year and we need to have heating moving through. Um, how often do we check the water quality within a hydronic heating loop? Not very often, but I think it's probably practical to think about it, ensuring that you've got the proper pH. You may do a microbiological sample, you might also want to check if it's got glycol, what the glycol percentage it might be in place, and also those cross connections, the makeup water going to it. It's not a bad time to really take a look and evaluate all parts of your system, whether it be your heating, cooling, ventilation, or water drinking water supply. It's a good time to review everything. Jason, we do have some questions coming in through the GoToWebinar system. Absolutely. Yep. Tim, we just um, quickly look. So the first one is, are there Canadian resources specific to flushing slash disinfection re-COVID stagnation? 
Yeah, so there are some components coming out from individual health units. I'm falling back at the moment and looking at drinking water standards. And if you look at the regulations within, and I'll speak with Ontario's for a moment, Ontario has Reg 170, and it talks about the drinking water system and the requirements. It doesn't really talk about the building itself, but as a good practice, I think it's something that uh, the members of CWQA and CIPH could have uh, part of our checklist, take a look at some of those components that would be a good thing to start with. So what's the requirement? And I'll just give you an example. This is just in conversation. So pretend you would run the water for three minutes, you would do a chlorine sample, you would check to see what that chlorine sample level was, it would meet the minimum requirement, and then you would allow the water to sit. Or is it something that you have to go to the beginning of the system, add in a disinfectant like chlorine, shock the building, and ensure that we've got a residual at as many points as possible, then resample. There's a number of things to think about. I mentioned earlier on about the conflict or the crossover or gray areas between various trades and regulations and certifications. And if you were to have all the licenses to work from the water main or drinking water system through to the end user, it's about five different certifications. And very few people have all of those certifications, but it's definitely something to consider talking to each one of them in the team to ensure that the water quality is good there. Any other ones on the uh, the board? Yes, we have uh, actually a lot coming in now. Yeah, um, hey, hey, Jason, are there any specific regulations for water filter systems installed for food service equipment like ice cream machines or uh, coffee machines? Mm -hmm. Shelly, do you want to take that one? That sounds like a CWQA question. Well, there's definitely, I mean, there will be um, uh, safety standards that are in place, but again, best practices would be after a period of time that um, that that equipment has been uh, inactive uh, would be to completely uh, do a full filter change um, and while the filters are out maybe do a, a flush of the lines as well as if there's needing to be any disinfectant added or anything like that and then replace those filters and and then again test test and test you want to have your best practices that way mm -hmm. can you speak to the use of ozone in the water purification process and its potential effects. Mm -hmm. So that's from Josh. Uh, James? Yes, absolutely. So ozone in systems is a disinfectant, powerful disinfectant, and it's becoming more popular and more widely used. And there are a number of companies, uh, some Canadian and some very local companies to where I live, uh, that have um, truly made a mark on using ozone for treatment systems. I think that ozone, uh, as well as any other disinfectant, has a, a, a good place in the system and can really be a benefit to what's moving forward. As we adapt to what's being asked of us within our disinfection or our systems and or flushing our systems, I think we need to look at all components of disinfection. And ozone is one I think can have a real benefit as it's being used and being applied correctly. Have a good look at ozone as an opportunity because it does have some great opportunities going forward. Okay, absolutely. Uh, later on, uh, if Josh wanted to send a direct email to CIPH, I can easily give them a number of contacts or people to talk to that are very intrinsically attached to ozone and its use, and uh, that might be a great uh, a great way to keep the conversation going. If a building has been shut down for some time, would a high temperature flush be beneficial? That's interesting. Um, our last AGM, we had a, a, a very open conversation about this exact topic about using water and high quality water for flushing. What temperature do you have to raise piping systems to to ensure that you remove bacteria? Well, or, or viruses or anything there you're getting into the level of pasteurization or boiling. And do you want to succumb your piping system or appliances to that level of temperature? We've had luck in the past uh, running very high temperature water, 180 degree water through the lines at different times to disinfect or, or to try and flush the system. And it's worked very, very well. Again, I think as we consider different ways to promote the health of our systems, we have to consider all options and maybe use all options. And maybe that's a chance for you to experiment within your building to see whether that's a good choice. Uh, hot water systems, again, 
with the right temperature can be very effective and very friendly to the system. Watch out, if you have other people in the building, you wouldn't want that hot water running through a line and someone unexpectedly turning on a cold tap and finding out that it's very, very hot water. Just be careful with that one. Do any provinces have guidelines developed? Mm -hmm. So Ontario, I know, has some uh, COVID-19 guidelines that are coming through and I've been actively looking online, looking for different components. Um, as part of this presentation, at the end of it, to the, uh, the people who have joined in, we will gladly send out some documents and links to places where we found or I found uh, uh, good documents to go through, uh, including uh, some in Ontario and uh, Nova Scotia is, I think, in talks with Shelley right now talking about water treatment and certifications and understanding about, you know, what are best practices for those sorts of things. And I think that comes back to that checklist template. I think that is going to be a a critical component of best practices to ensure that we're getting our systems up and running. Again, not just for the professionals, but as a building owner, as a person using the water regularly, and then also as we move, move forward in the future. Maybe it's something that will be done more regularly. Will lead be a concern in a building sitting stagnant for the last eight weeks? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so back to my comment about custodians and janitors. Custodians and janitors are, uh, again, some of the most valuable people when we talk about understanding a building. They're in the building every day using it. And if I go back to, the, again, the mid-60s, the first thing they would do is turn water on and flush the water through the system. And I think that really has benefits to it, whether that's on something that happens on a regular basis or something that's going to be moving forward lead can be in the system simply because of the age of the building the types of materials that were used at the time of construction and as regulation has changed i don't think it's ever a bad thing to run a little water first or flush the system first before using it now, now we Jason, get the water efficiency. i was just going to say it's uh, i think the um a awwa recommends that you go uh flushing for cold water first hot water second um, and at a very minimum of 30 minutes uh, with respect to uh, trying to flush the lines with any lead or particles and things like that. And on any hot water side of things, especially hot water tanks, you might have to step it up to about 45 minutes of flushing to make that happen. So, um, you know, just to, to obtain that proper disinfection. Um, the other thing they might have to do is, is to do it twice. So the first flush might just be to get some of those particles out the lead you know from the pipes and or iron or hardness that might have accumulated and and sloughed off and then the second time might be to run that disinfection to get that um, if it's chlorine that you're using for the disinfection to make sure that it's at that last stop that you're getting the proper reading for the disinfection yes and and remember too the the only true way to understand what you may have in your water system is to do some testing so take a moment, do some preliminary testing on a facility if you have any, you know, inkling or ideas that maybe there's something that may need to be looked at, do some testing. And then it'll help you understand better what you should do to maintain the facility. We've had plenty of places where we've had uh, really high coliform counts or uh, platelet counts coming back and we don't understand why. And it's been something that we've just neglected, either a filter or an RO module or a cross connection but we would have had no idea unless we were doing that testing. So follow up with that. So we're coming down to the last couple of minutes of time. I'd like to leave the last few minutes in the area, in the question side here and for, uh, for Sarah and for Therese to think about as well in questions that could come in. Are there any other topics that you would like to dig down deeper into for another potential webinar or something in an information session? We have the checklist. That's a great thing that we'll bring forward. What else could we bring in to help the industry out as we go through? So enter in a few concerns or later on, email them over to, to our group and we'll gladly help out with uh, getting that information out and or link you up with the people who may have some great answers. Some of the manufacturers we have within our associations are fantastic resources, have great products that they can use to help with some of these situations. We want to be able to utilize those great members that we've got. I also would like to mention that uh, after the presentation is over today, we will be sending out a survey um, with the exact same or a similar question um, that's going to be in the survey. So if you have 
anything that comes to mind after the webinar today, please feel free to, to uh, fill out that question in the survey. Uh, or like Jason said, you can email any of us here at CAPH or CWQA and uh, we can put you in contact with the appropriate people. I've got another question here for my side that has come up. It says, um, you know, it talks about water filters and water uh, food equipment service standards. And, and yes, um, I think Shelly already answered part of this with understanding about water filters, but um, uh, I'll stress the the concern that it's fairly cheap insurance to change a set of filters, flush the system and ensure that the water quality coming from those filters is uh, up to standard as well. So I think it's uh, just a good practice to look at all your mechanical systems, drinking water, piping, plumbing, whichever it is, and just have a real good evaluation of what may or may not be there. For those of you who, who wrote in questions here, because um, we do have quite a few still left, um, what I can do is I'll send uh, Jason an email, Jason and Shelley an email after the presentation today, mm -hmm. and I'll email you the answer to your question back. I do have all of your names and your email addresses, so uh, your question will be answered. I, I will send you an email about it. Yes, and I have more time at home than usual, so I'll gladly answer as many as we can. So it looks like we're at uh, near the end of our time. I'd uh, I'd like to uh, sign off on my side saying thank you for all who attended. It uh, looks like a great attendance for the number of people on, online that I can see. I hope that you continue asking questions and looking and considering. And one of the things, if you've walked by a specific point in your building or a system a hundred times, and after a presentation like this, you stop and think, maybe there's more to what I need to look at then this webinar was a complete success. So continue asking questions, and if you have any further ones, please send them through. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Jason. Everyone. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you, everyone, for joining our webinar. And uh, this is the end of our webinar. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.